Sing with us. Here we go.
Is heaven loved away? The Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave. The war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broke. The ground began to shake.
Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> I hope everybody's doing great today. I want to give us all permission to do something today. I want to give us all permission today to feel good. It's okay to feel good. It's okay to be super happy. It's okay to walk around whistling and, and smiling all the time, brothers and sisters. I mean, if that song is correct, and it is, there is no more death. There is no death for you and me. I mean, you understand that, right? It's okay to celebrate the fact that there is no death. The, the grave is just a doorway. It is, it is just a doorway for us to walk through to eternal life. And not because of anything we have done, but precisely because of what Jesus has done, the lamb. God becoming a sweet little lamb in order to do that for you and me. How ridiculous, but how true and how wonderful. So it's okay to feel good. It's okay to feel confident. It's okay to, to be excited about your life, no matter what the circumstances may seem. It's okay to celebrate every second. It's okay. You might seem goofy. They will seem goofy in eternity for not doing it. You will, you will be the one who seems normal and, and, and all, all of that, brothers and sisters. We are going, as I said before, we are going to share the gospel with the community we live in. And we're going to take a big step towards that. We're organizing with some churches as we speak, we need people to put stuff in bags, as Tim said. We need people to pray. We need people to drive. We need people who, of able body and willing mind, I was hoping I said they're able body and willing mind and excited spirit, to put bags on doors. This is how we're going to start. At my previous two churches, the, probably the biggest objection I heard to evangelism was, I'm scared. I don't know, I don't know that I know what to say. What happens if they reject me? What happens if this? What happens if that? Well, let me go and make you a promise. You're going to be rejected. Somebody's going to laugh at you. Somebody's going to tell you no. And, and I'm not saying, I'm not trying to mock them for that, but somebody's going to do that, friends. Well, they're going to do that out of great ignorance. Okay, Jesus was rejected. Paul was rejected. Every Christian that's ever tried to share the gospel on a regular basis has been rejected, but there might be that one, that one individual that, that you know for all eternity that says, you know what, I didn't know, and you had the guts to come share the gospel with me. Thank you so much. So that forever and ever and ever and ever and ever I can live in great peace and celebration. That's what we're going to start doing. And I think we should feel good about it. I think we should feel good about singing God's praises. I want us to feel good about who we are in Christ. I want us to feel excited about it because it's, there's nothing. You know what? My Gamecocks won yesterday. It was fantastic. But, and I got excited but it's nothing compared to what this Jesus does. And Clemson won too, whatever, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Um, what was I saying? I don't even know what I was saying now. <laughs> feeling good, that's right, feeling good. All right, let's pray, let's pray. Our grace is heavenly Father, it is, it is a good day to celebrate. It's a good day to feel good. It's a good day to hope no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter about those bills, and the basket on the table, no matter about that loved one we have who's suffering or not living correctly, regardless of these things, regardless of what the television man or woman tells us, Father, there is a loving God that is in control, and Jesus has defeated death forever and ever, and there's nothing that neither height nor depth nor angels nor demons nor life nor death nor anything else in all creation can do to change that. You are a loving God. We have everything we need. We have everything we need because Jesus the Lamb died for us conquering death and the earth exploded in celebration and we do the same so father pour out your spirit upon us today that we would worship you in spirit and in truth as we learn as we're going to learn in just a minute it is the worshipers in this world are the ones who are victorious the worshipers in this world father so guide us to do just that to honor you and glorify you in all that we do we ask it all in jesus precious and wonderful name we pray amen you know today as we uh, talk about everything that we're gonna do with Saturate Polk and how we're gonna spread God's word. Um, it made me think about this song. I asked my buddy Howie to come and sing a song this week. I didn't know what song we were gonna sing, um, and he brought up this song. And uh, as um, Ken was talking about Saturate Polk this morning, and, and, and uh, Pastor Jeff was just talking about that uh, we're called to go out and bring people to the Lord. Uh, that's exactly what this song says. It says, as we go out into this world, let them see you in me. You know, it's not about me or anything that I do. I want them to see you, the you 
your spirit in me, and that's what brings people to Christ. So uh, I know you guys were blessed this morning by my buddy Howison. I give my life an offering, take it all, take everything, and let them see you in me, let them hear you when I speak, Lord, let them feel you. So let them see. Amen, amen. Let's stand together and continue our worship today with Overcome. Pastor Jeff's going to join us on this one.
Sing with me. Seated above, in front in the Father's love. Destined to die, poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, the perfect and spot.
Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, praise the Lord. What you guys don't realize is that the system just went out halfway through. And, and I'm just all messed up. Here, but, uh, there we go. <laughs> okay, how about that? Is that better? All right, praise you. Let me get my Bible and my jacket so I can be official. <clears throat> I need Topher to dress me and all that kind of stuff. So it sounded better the second half, huh? Well, praise the Lord for that. Well, it is good, friends. It is really, really good, as I said before, to be here with you. Um, it really is. I really, gosh, I really enjoy coming here every Sunday. I hope that you do too. If you enjoy coming here every Sunday, give a round of applause. Can I hear something good? Yes, that's what I want to hear. Thank you very much. So if you notice, the, um, the title of the sermon series that we're going to start is going to be called Real Characters of the Bible. And I don't mean as in real characters. Don't say it like that. It's, it's the way we say it in the South. Oh, he's a real character. That person, that Madeline, that Ken, they're real characters. You know what I'm saying? That's the way you're missing it. Real characters of the Bible. People who, who just regular folks like you and me that, that, who had personalities and ways of doing things, who found it easy to rebel against God, many of them. Um, and yet God seemed to use them anyway. Those are the types of people that I want and how God got into their lives and changed it and mixed it up and made them laugh, made them cry, made them comfortable, made them uncomfortable, delivered them, put them in jail, all those things 
That's what, you know, we're going to see how they handled that and what God did through that. That's what we're going to be talking about in this sermon series leading up to Christmas. Real characters of the Bible, just like you and me, just people just like you and me. It is not, it is not correct, historically correct, to assume that there's any allegory going on into these persons. These were all real people. Jesus had to be real. He couldn't be an allegory to die for us. Then it would be fake. You know, then it wouldn't be a real death. Adam and Eve were real. Otherwise, we wouldn't be guilty of their sin. They had to be real persons. Same thing is true of everybody we're talking about today. Cain and Abel were real. It's not just a lesson, although there is a lesson contained in their story. Cain and Abel were real brothers. They were real persons, real, real folks who lived, you know, lived and breathed the air. Like they had skin. They, you know, they, 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 they're just like you and me. They had feelings and emotions and things like that. So we're going to be speaking about that and how, how God worked through them and, and how God sort of molded them and shaped them in, into becoming the people that they were, the, the worshipers, the God followers. And that's where we're to be. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to probably spend two or three weeks on Cain and Abel. There's just so much to unpack here. Um, but hopefully it'll give us a better understanding of the world we live in, of our lives, as we understand Cain and Abel and, and sort of the two lines that began in the world, the two lines of humanity that began right there and how they started, then the rest of history just makes a lot, a lot of sense. What we're living today makes a lot more sense if, we're, if we understand that these two separate lines that existed throughout all of history. I have a question for you this morning, brothers and sisters. Have you ever wondered why? Have you ever really sat back and wondered why the world is the way that it is? You ever really contemplated why is the world the way that it is? Why are we so, amongst other things, why is one consistent trait of all humanity throughout all of history, it doesn't matter whether you're Christian or not, why are we so completely, consistently hypocritical? Why do we find it so easy to know we're supposed to do things one way and do them the other? Why, why is that so easily included in our daily repertoire? It is in mine. You know, I'll wake up in the morning, man, have a prayer with my girls, you know, sit down and pray with my wife, have a little devotional. We got Jesus music in the background. I'm trying to walk around all holy, oh, you know, like I'm the dad, the leader of the family. And then I take my daughter on the way to school during rush hour, rush hour traffic, and somebody dare cut me off. And rush hour, it's like, what are you thinking, man? I mean, I'm just, you know, wh why do I do that? Why am I so, com and then why do I turn around and say, well, I'm just this great holy preacher, man? Why are we so consistently, why is history full of hypocrites? Not living up to our own standards of right and wrong. Why do we seem to have so much potential and so much hope but fail miserably at achieving a genuinely new kind of society where people come first, where things really truly go different in the world for the better of all mankind? Why do we sing of these songs but never accomplish what we sing? Well, the answer from, of, of many answers, the answer is because we fail to genuinely worship. And I'm going to convince you of that today in the next couple of weeks. We fail to become genuine worshipers throughout the world. Now, there are other reasons as well. There are other details to that, but, but ultimately it comes down to our failure to, to be what God created us to be. And that, brothers, is our people in relation, continue relation with our creator and continue worshiping him and his goodness and his majesty and his generosity and his love. Genuine, fully committed to worship. These hands were, were, were made for many things, but primarily they were made to raise to heaven, to sing his prayer. This, va this voice that I used to curse so many times is used, is used to, to sing his praises. These feet are, are, are made to dance before my father, my creator. That is the primary reason that I have all of these limbs and, and these opportunities is, is for the opportunity to come to God in genuine worship. History repeats itself over and over. And folks who for easily forget God take all his resources, breathe his air every day, enjoy all the gifts and blessings that he gives us, and we're going to talk about that in a minute too, and sort of live like everything is everything, like he doesn't exist. Ecclesiastes says that. History repeats, everything's the same. Nothing, there's nothing new under the sun, according to Solomon, Ecclesiastes. Everything is all the same. All of history, this, the same people do the same things. They might not wear the same clothes, might not speak the same language, but we live the same exact lives over and over and over. History, there's nothing new under the sun. And yet God has put a protection on godless society 
because he put a protective mark upon Cain so that he was able to thrive. And that is why the world, in all its hypocrisy and all of our failure, still, generally speaking, is able to thrive at least for a time, to live, to, to acquire stuff, to, to, to many times to, to live in such a way where we can easily, on a daily day basis, forget God, and that is until the hurricane comes or death calls or whatever. And God did this because he is gracious. And he is patient and hoping that we would repent in worship. We call this common grace. The rain falls, the sun shines on the good and the evil all alike. That is called God's common grace. And that is true. Is it not true that the rain falls all over the world, the sun shines all over the world? Generally speaking, people have families and friends and loved ones, and they're able to eat and have homes, some bigger than others. But so what? That is that common grace that none of us deserve. Godless society, however, can only go so far. It can only achieve so much before the curse of sin and forgetting about God inevitably falls upon it and it will fail. The Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Sumerians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Ottomans, the Nazis, and so many more raised up gigantic empires that on the surface looked like they could never be defeated, looked like they would never fail because God's common grace is poured throughout the world until the inevitable weight of sin and the curse and the lack of worship and the lack of a relationship with our creator falls and the downward spiral begins. It is intrinsic in that the seeds of failure and death exist in all of us and exist in everything we come up with. And that explains better than any other philosophy the reality we live in all non-worshipping civilization lives in open rebellion against God, even though they live under his common peace and his common grace, at least for a while. Eventually, they will be judged. They will fail themselves because they can't even live up to our own standards. We are hypocrites. Godless society is one without the protection of worship. And I'm going to say that again. Godless society is the one without the protection of worship, the protection of God's presence, so that we live without the presence of God, and are reduced to seeking compensation wherever we can find it in a dying world. You see that? That is the height of what we do. We continually seek compensation wherever we can find it in a cursed and dying and spiraling world that, is, that, is, that where moth and rust destroy. So you see, logically speaking, we shouldn't expect history to say anything else. It's only through worship, friends, that we are protected. We are all born with the heart and a mind of Cain, and only find deliverance whenever we become more like Abel, the brother of righteousness. And that's what we're going to talk about the next two or three weeks and how history was begun here in Genesis 3, Genesis 4. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 4 this morning. Begin with the first verse, and I'll continue on down through verse 16. Then I'll flip over to Jude, verse 10 through 12, and 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. Per usual, beloved, let us listen as God speaks to us. Now Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. And she said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. And later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought the fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was angry, and his face was downcast. And then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. And now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel, and he killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer upon the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. 
If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. And then the Lord put a mark upon Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden, Jude 10, 11, and 12. Yet these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand. And what things they do understand by instinct, like unreasoning animals, these are the very things that destroy them. Like unreasoning animals, the things that they do are like unreasoning animals are the things that destroy them. Woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's air. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These men are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit, uprooted, twice dead. My goodness. 1 John 3, verse 7. Chapter 3, verse 7. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who's do, who does right is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. This is how we know we are children of God, and who are the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. This is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do rejoice over the reading of your word, the truth contained therein. Our gracious Lord, I pray that your spirit would be amongst us, that you would speak through me, that we would hear you. We ask it all in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So we see the continual cycle of history here. Genesis chapter 3, man and woman, Adam and Eve, were put in the garden. They were, were, were surrounded by perfection, abundance times abundance times abundance that you and I can't even imagine uh, in, in a cursed world. They, they, they had abundance, they had goodness, they had pleasure, they had love, they had, everything was good beyond measure. We just can't even fathom what the Garden of Eden must have been like. And they were told, do this and go do that, enjoy this, be blessed by that, but stay away from the one stinking tree. Come walk with me every day, worship me every day, be in relationship with me every day, enjoy my abundance and all, and spread throughout the world, just stay away, just, there's got to be one thing you can't have. And we decided that this God, who wanted to be near us, and we didn't want to be near him. We wanted all the stuff, and just didn't want him. And we ate listening to the voice of the enemy, and we fell. Then verse, excuse me, chapter 4 opens, and Adam and Eve are banished from God's presence. Then chapter 4 opens, full of hope, full of expectation. Eve saying, finally, God has blessed me with the gift of a man, and thinking probably through this man, the world will be saved. What does she say here in chapter 4? Adam lay with his wife, she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. She's saying that very victoriously. With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. And, of course, I mean, I know that I can understand why women are so excited left to birth because I've watched my wife have two. It is a very exciting time after much difficulty. With the birth of the Lord, I have brought forth a man, and then he gave birth to his brother. Then she gave birth to his brother, Abel, as if he was some kind of afterthought. Lots of hope, lots of excitement, lots of promise, lots of expectation of good things. But why? Well, I think it's clear from the context of chapter 3, the promise God made to the serpent, certainly in Adam and, Eve, Adam and Eve's hearing, was that even though all this fall happened, even though the curse happened, even though we're going to be separated from God, God promised us, speak, God speaking through the serpent, promising us that it was to be through the seed of a woman. A man was to come who was going to undo all this mess. Now, God in his genius knew what history was going to be like. He knew where he was going to hide Jesus. In a manger in Bethlehem, out in the middle of nowhere where nobody could see. 
I think the enemy was smart, at least as smart as he could be, in thinking that perhaps Cain was going to be that seed. Everybody else did. Cain means to acquire. Cain means to get. That's what Cain means. This man is going to get stuff for us. This man is going to go acquire stuff. He's going to fix stuff for us. Obviously, he was the, the, more, the more capable brother, the more attractive brother. He carried the weight of his, of his parents' expectations. And being the most uh, attractive brother is something that I know all about. <laughs> and I wish my brother Jason was here to hear that. <laughs> or not. Or not. <laughs> and then there was just this other Abel who just means breath, wind, nothing. And God in his genius does not think like us. You see, God uses the little things according to 1 Corinthians of the world to do his big work. And I stand here exactly representing that. God uses the insignificant things, the not so obvious things, brothers and sisters, to do his work. While well, everybody in the world, including the enemy, apparently was looking at Cain and trying, and the enemy wanted to ruin Cain so badly. This was the seed. Maybe this was the one who was to come to thwart all my plans. Let me get in him and get in him. He did. Ruining his heart, ruining his mind, ruining everything about him. These two brothers could not have been more different. Even though they were probably twins, they could not have been more too different. So right there from the very beginning, we are introduced to two separate lines of people who will compete against each other and who will define history. One was a worshiper of God. The other became a man who acquired stuff and lived a life as such. Now, again, friends, there's nothing wrong with stuff. I want you to acquire stuff, just not at the expense of your worship. You see that? I want us all to have good stuff. It's not the expense of your relationship with God. Not expense of what you give God. Not at the expense of your love for a God who is all deserving of the best we have to give. So Abel brings, Cain brings, so it's time to come worship. That's what the context, it's time to come worship. God is a God who requires worship. So we have Cain, we have Abel, they're coming, it's time to come worship. They've already begun their professions. This is somewhere down the road, they're probably a little bit older. They're probably used to worship and God's requiring them to come out to worship again. Abel's doing his flocks. Cain, like his brother, is out in the field doing his crops. And, this, and God calls and hey, it's time to come worship and to fellowship with me. And that's the context, that's what's going on here. We're told here that Abel brought of the that portions, the firstborn of all that he had. Cain just brought something. Cain just showed up. You see the stark difference in attitude here. Abel, it says here, brought from, let's see, in verse 3, in the course of time, Cain brought the first four. Abel brought the fat portions from some of the first one of his flock. The Lord looked upon favor with Abel and his offering. Uh, uh, but Cain, in verse 3, just brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. So Abel did, or Cain did precisely this. Cain did what, what my crisper looks like after I leave the lettuce in there too long. Okay? He had already enjoyed all that God had blessed him with because everything belongs to God anyway. And he allows us to have it. We don't grow those crops. We don't. It gives us the ability to go out and dig around and do some stuff. God is the one who does it. He provides the soil. You know that old joke about the devil. The devil, the devil I'm, I'm going to compete with you. You grow this and I'll grow that and see who can grow something better. And the devil said, cool, cool, cool. And the devil starts digging and God says, well, get your own dirt. <laughs> so Cain, okay, it's time to go to worship. Give me the leftover lettuce that I'm not going to eat out of the crisper. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Here. And it says, God did not look fondly upon that offering. Abel brought from the first, por the first portions, the, the first fruits of his, he brought the oldest, he brought the firstborn, and not only just the firstborn, but the fatty portions, the best portion of the firstborn. That's what Abel did, a totally different, in other words, Abel, Abel had one sheep in his hand. He was the firstborn, and Abel said, well, this is all I got. You know, but not only am I going to give you all I got, but I'm going to give you the best part of what I got, I, and I'm going to trust that you're going to bring some more. You see the difference there? I'm going to trust you because worshiping you, fellowshipping with you is more important than me having a freezer stock full of meat. Cain just says, well, here's that lettuce, God. Um, I'll be back next year. See ya. Thanks. Appreciate it. Bye. 
And God looked upon favor upon Abel. Hebrews 11 says that Abel gave in faith and Cain did not. God became a bother, becomes a bother quickly to the line of Cain. Banished from his presence. That's why God was angry with Cain's offering. Cain means to get, to acquire. As Eve so pro excitedly prophesied, Cain would eventually build the first city to, to, to bring human perspective protection and an ability to acquire quite a bit, yet in doing so, he lost everything beforehand. And brothers and sisters, that is precisely, precisely, precisely the way of the world, the explanation of history. Cain is about to, living in such a way and doing what he has to do in order to acquire stuff. Part of him wanted to appease God. A little part of him wanted to appease God because he knew that he needed to do so, but it was just a means to an end for him. Cain gave God his leftovers, as we said. Abel, on the other hand, knew that everything belonged to God and was in such appreciation for God and who God was and what he had done and his grace and his mercy to his family. But even though they sinned, he brought the best that he had, which he received from God. Abel took his relationship with God seriously. Cain did not. Abel took worship seriously. Cain did not. And the rest, as they say, is history. Now, normally there isn't anything wrong whatsoever with being a shepherd versus a farmer. Neither one is better than the other, and they aren't really in this case in the sense either. It wasn't better that Abel was a, was a farmer over being a shepherd. One wasn't better than the other necessarily in God's eyes. And the commentators will insist that there's nothing there to talk about. Well, I disagree with that. It is true that, w that one profession isn't better than the other in, in, in and of itself. And yet, post-fall, a blood sacrifice is necessary in the order for us to worship God. What does it say after Adam and Eve sinned? God, they went around, they put on what? Leaves. They, they covered themselves. They wanted to fix the problem by covering themselves with leaves. Remember that? The fig leaf. The problem is we owe God a death. What did God say? Adam, if you eat of the wrong tree, if you become a sinner, you will die. Sinners owe God a death, especially sinning in such a stupid way like Adam and Eve did, and us falling with them, okay? So in order to appease that, we have, the blood has we have to die. So God clothed them in skins so that he could once again commune with them. You see, that's what's going on. God sat, made a sacrifice to replace them. That's what sacrifices became throughout all the scriptures, was a means to, to be able to approach God because God allowed for a while that sacrifice to be a propitiation for what we owe God. That guilt was temporarily laid upon that animal. That blood was shed on the altar where God's presence resides. So now that we can once again come in God's presence and commune with him because he's a holy God and he can't stand to look upon sin. He can't do it. He's just so, he's so holy he can't be around what is evil and dark and gross. And me the worst of it. So Abel, being smart, understood that. If Cain did what he was supposed to do, he would have brought an offering from his, from his crop, but he would have also gone to his brother and said, hey, dude, what's up? I need a lamb. I need a lamb. I need to make a blood sacrifice so that I, too, can be in communion with God. Ultimately, Jesus is our sacrifice. No longer do we have to go to the store or do we have to go to the temple and make a blood sacrifice in order to commune with God because Jesus has taken, according to Hebrews, that upon himself. He is that sacrifice. He is that life. We owe God a death, friends. That's our reality. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be mean. We owe God a death, and deep down we all know it. And we can't come into his presence without that. By his grace and mercy, he allows us, just like he allowed Cain, the opportunity to come to God through a sacrifice. And Cain refused to do it. And as a result, his face was downcast. Did God reject Cain outright? No. He said, listen, man, sin is crouching your door. Relax. Okay, pay attention, pay attention. Don't, I'm going to lift up your face. Don't walk around all sad. Don't walk around all angry. Just If you do right, will you not be accepted? It's simple. I've made it simple for you. I'm not, even, I'm not even asking you to cut yourself. Go get a lamb. Just do it the right way. Because we owe God a death, brothers and sisters. Now, the enemy obviously knew or obviously thought that Cain was the seed of the woman. That's why he entered him and got him to do what he did. And Cain kills his brother Abel out of jealousy. And so is the way of the world. 
the only blood that Cain was willing to shed was that of his brother Abel. We're only to shed blood to atone for sin, not to indulge that very sin. The enemy obviously saw Cain as that evil, or as that seed that would destroy him, and that's why he used him in order to try to destroy his righteous brother. And finally, I'll end with this today. We'll begin with this next week. What does God say about the blood that was shed? What does God say about the blood of righteous Abel? It cries to me from the ground. The blood of a righteous, the blood of the righteous continually speaks to God. You see that? The blood of the righteous one continually calls out to God and moves him to action. And that blood spoke to God, at least until in what Hebrew says, the blood of Jesus came, and now the blood of Jesus, the better blood than Abel, continues to speak to God. The blood of Jesus speaks to God on our behalf for those of us who believe. We've been covered. We've been cleansed by that blood, according to Paul. We've been cleansed by that very blood that, so that God, does no, God no longer sees us in the rebellion of Cain. He sees us now in the righteousness of Abel and ultimately the righteousness of Jesus. And that's how we live our lives. That's the difference between us. No longer are we about acquiring. We're about worship. We're about communing with God. That's why we live, because the blood speaks to the Father. That blood is powerful. That blood, brothers and sisters, that blood is the blood that we use to rebuke the devil. He, he, he has no answer for the blood. of he has, Now that Abel has died, the, the devil is afraid of the blood of Abel and very much is afraid of the blood of Jesus. Some of us have gone around recently praying in this church and other places, rebuking the evil spirits, and believe it or not, we found some here. I don't want to scare you, but we have. Every church has them, or most every church has them, brothers and sisters. We find them, and we have rebuked them in the name of Jesus. And I've found, brothers and sisters, if I show up without praying, without, without that kind of rebuke, nothing much happens. But whenever we speak, whenever we sing God's praises, and we rebuke that is evil, that is dark in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, that which is present that is evil must flee. And it will every time, because it speaks. If you don't believe me, go with me next time I do it. And you'll see. Anyone doubting or looking at me funny right now? Go with me next time. And you'll see. The blood of Jesus works. It speaks. It covers us. It cleanses us. And I paid nothing. All I do is continue to fight the natural inclination I have to be like Cain. That's what I continue to do. The blood of Jesus has cleansed me. God sees me as righteous. The blood of Jesus continues to speak to me and brings me back. Modern American Christians, we are bad about straddling that fence. One foot over in Cain land, one foot over in Abel land. We are bad about that, friends. What I'm asking us to do, what I'm asking us all to do, and me especially because I'm the worst of all, what I'm asking us to do is take a strong step to the side of Abel, to the strong step of where Jesus, the blood of Jesus resides, friends so that we can become perpetual, momentary worshipers of the living God. He desires to walk with us. He desires to speak with us. He desires to commune with us more than he desires anything else. Why can't we, why is it impossible to be lukewarm with God? Jesus says that makes me want to vomit when you're lukewarm. Why is that impossible? It's because God's desire for us, desire to commune with us, burns so brightly. Burn, his love for us burns so completely, friends, that it is, it is impossible. It is impossible for him to accept lukewarmness for us. God has given us all a mountain full of stuff, and, 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 and we turn around and give back to him a Rubik's Cube from the gas station. Would you accept that from someone else? Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, it is good to know you. It is good to be in your presence. It is good to celebrate the fact that we have overcome in Jesus. It is good to live out these lives of perfect hope. We hope because we know that we have won. We hope because we know the Lamb has been slain. The perfect Lamb has been slain for us. We celebrate, Father, because because death is nothing but a doorway for us. It is not the end. It is the beginning. Hallelujah, Father. We celebrate you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. (laughs) Amen. Let's stand together this morning as we close our service.
I see a couple new faces, or at least they're new to me here today. You are most welcome. We're so glad you're here today. Um, I'm going to ask the elders to come up forward. If anyone needs prayer, if you're sick, whatever, if you want to come to Christ, if you want to give Jesus your everlasting soul, please come up here and talk to one of our elders. God is ready. God is ready, and he's willing to embrace you forever and ever, brothers and sisters. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and bring you peace, both now and evermore.